something for you. As a matter of fact, you want to take your Bible and go to John chapter 10, verse 10. And while you're turning there, uh, by the way, the title of today would be Living Well in 2014. Anybody want to live well in 2014? Anybody want 2014 to be better than 2013? Right? God does have some uh, principles and encouragement from Scripture that if we follow, we'll make those things happen. Let me just uh, say a couple things before we get started. It's an opportunity for me to just say some things off the cuff and from the heart. Is that all right? I believe that 2014 is going to be an incredible year for this spiritual family. Uh, in May of this year, we're scheduled to move into our new sanctuary. And how many know uh, we didn't build it so that we could stay the same? We're building this new sanctuary so we could, you know, just have us four and no more and, and just kind of have a better space to live. No, we made it to make room for more people. And how many know that's going to bring with it some changes? Okay, and it's going to bring with it some requirements on all of our parts to uh, think differently rather than coming to church to receive. All of us are going to have to begin to think differently about coming to church to serve and bless and minister. I'm preaching already. So I encourage you to be, be praying about that, be thinking about that. Next Sunday is Vision Sunday, the first end of the year, Vision Sunday. And, and we're going to take some time and rejoice and celebrate what God has done in our church in 2013. But also, I want to share with you what I think God is saying to us uh, as a church for the upcoming year. And we're also going to uh, give everybody an opportunity to listen to God. We're going to have some prayer time next Sunday where what is God saying to you about your life and your family and relationships? Relationships and, and vocations and, and, and habits and, and priorities and spiritual disciplines and things like that. So you don't want to miss next Sunday as we share with that. We'll be starting uh, small groups here in just a few weeks. And so make sure that you start 2014 the right way. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Jesus said, I came so that you could have this squeaking by, barely holding on life in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I came and died on the cross. I rose from the grave. I defeated Satan. I, I overcame all of the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places so that you could live this mealy mouth, milk toast, half hearted existence, just holding on till Jesus comes. Is that what that verse says? No, Jesus said, I came that you might have life. And not just any old kind of life, but abundant life, a great life, an awesome life through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 says, be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. The scripture says in the days that we live that are evil, he says, make the most of every opportunity. He says, make the most of it. Make the most of the days that you live in, even if the days are evil. And we would all testify these days are getting pretty evil. And yet the, the scripture says, make the most of the time that you have. Make the most of the days that you have. Live well in 2014. Let me give you a few encouragements from scripture to make sure that 2014 is a, is a year that you live well. You may want to write these down. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment to, to write these down. Okay, grab a pen, a piece of pen and a paper, all right, to take some notes as an encouragement. Who knows, today may turn out to be a divine appointment for all of us. What a novel thought that the steps of righteous men and women are ordered of the Lord. I'm just saying. Okay, if you want to live well in 2014, are you ready? Write this down. Number one. Ready? I'm going to say it slow. Slow down. If you're going to live well in 2014, the very first thing that we need to do is slow down. Psalm 39 verse 6 says, all our busy rushing ends in nothing. All of our busy rushing ends in nothing. We can stand at the end of 2013 and we look back on the last 12 months and we think, wow, that went fast. It just flew by. And we wonder, did we accomplish anything? Did we get anything done? Did we advance ourselves, our lives, our, our walk with God, our, our families, our vocation, whatever we do? Because it, we know we were busy. Matter of fact, we use that as an excuse a thousand times. I'm too busy. But then we look back and we think, did we truly accomplish anything? 
Matter of fact, I'm sitting here today thinking, didn't we just do this? Didn't we just talk about this a year ago? It seems like a month ago. Listen, the scripture says, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27, reverence for the Lord adds hours to each day. If you're going to live the abundant life, live well in 2014, we've got to slow down. And the way that we slow down, the scripture says, is to give reverence to the Lord or put God first. If you put God first, the scripture says your life will slow down. Now, the opposite of that is true. If our life is just out of control fast, it's probably an indication that God is not first. Wow, I already feel this today. This is good. (laughs) Isn't it great? Proverbs 3, verse 6 of the Living Bible says, In everything put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. So if I put God first, the Bible says he's going to make sure that every effort I give is success. Instead of all of my busy rushing, ending in nothing, he's going to make sure that I have success if I put God first. And when I put God first, something happens, the scripture says, because it adds hours to each day. How many times have we said, boy, if I could only have another, instead of a 24-hour day, I need a 25-hour day. If I only had a couple more hours per day to get stuff done, I could get some stuff done. Well, the Bible says there's a way for you to do that. Just put God first. How do I put God first in your, in your life? A few things. First is prayer, right? Making prayer a regular habit in your life. In a, just a few weeks, we're going to uh, lay out a 40-day prayer challenge, for everybody, and we're going to challenge everybody to participate in the 40 day prayer challenge. Very similar to last year at this time when we did 40 days in the Word. What are we trying to do? We're trying to build the habit of daily prayer in your life. How many know uh, we don't have a religion, we have a relationship? Now, we preach that and we say amen, but the reality is that a lot of folks have, have, have turned Christianity into a religion because it's about a set of beliefs versus a relationship with God. You have a relationship with God if you pray. If you don't pray, you don't have a relationship with God. I'm preaching now, right? So one of the ways I build this into my life, I have an amen corner right here. I'm going I'm to focus right here, all right? Praise God for that. Prayer is one way you put God first in your life. Reading the scriptures is the way you put God first in your life. Pastor Tim just talked about the Bible reading plans that we, that, we are, that we put together for you. As you begin in planning the new year, plan for the scripture, daily Bible readings to be part of your life. And it will help you slow your life down. Fasting will slow your life down. Really slow. <laughs> when you fast and pray, you just kind of turn everything off and focus on God. It's amazing how that works. And giving also helps you put God first in your life. Somebody say amen. So if you want to live well in 2014, you got to slow down. Everybody say slow down. down. Number two, if you want to live well in 2014, look for people to love. Look for people to love. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. Listen to the scripture. It's not on the screen. So listen closely. If in any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God has given you, there are Israelites in need, then do not be selfish and refuse to help them. Now, let me sit back for a second. This is Deuteronomy. This is the Old Testament. God's giving instructions to the children of Israel as they enter to the promised land. He says, if any of you, uh, if, if in any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God has given you, there are Israelites in need, do not be selfish and refuse to help them. Instead, be generous and lend them as much as they need. Do not refuse to lend them something just because the year when debts are canceled is near. Don't let such an evil thought into your mind. If you refuse to make the loan, they'll cry out to the Lord against you and you will be held guilty. Give to them freely and unselfishly and the Lord will bless you in everything you do. (laughs) There will always be some Israelites who are poor and in need. And so I command you to be generous to them. Now, let me just make this clear to you. Here's what the scripture is saying. Selfishness is the number one reason people are unhappy. The reason that we're down in the mully grubs and depressed and just kind of beaten down is because we're so focused on ourselves. 
The scripture says, be very careful that when you see a person in need to help them, to bless them, look for people to love. Can I tell you the happiest people in the world are the people who are looking for opportunities to bless, to encourage, to strengthen, to, to come alongside somebody. Is there an amen out there today? Now listen, in the, in the days of the Jewish tradition, many of you may know that when a woman was discouraged, she was allowed to take a big pan, like a, a metal pan like we would have today, uh, and with some type of instrument, maybe it was some sort of spoon that they made or whatever, she could walk down the street and beat on that pan because she was discouraged. So she'd walk down the street and beat on the pan. What did that mean? Everybody heard it. You know, I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I'm down. Now, we don't beat the pans anymore today because we have Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> Come on, somebody. What is she saying? I need attention. I need encouragement. I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to pray for me. And that was a way for people to make their need known. Did you know there are lots of people in our lives that are beating on pants? And we can't ignore them. God has put us in their lives to bless them, to help them, to encourage them. Our first response is, I, I don't have time. I got my own stuff to worry about. Don't you know how bad I've got it? Let me beat my pan. My pan is bigger than your pan. My pan can beat louder than your pan. The little boy who, whose dad doesn't live with them needs attention. Single mom, everybody needs love. A few weeks ago on Wednesday night, we did a world's largest Christmas party. And if you were here on that Wednesday night, I'm gonna tell you, easily the best service of the whole year, easily. Incredible night. People come forward to give their lives to Christ and uh, it's kind of funny because sometimes, you know, people you've never been to church before, and a lot of those folks have never been to church before, when I invited them to come forward, they came all the way forward, up the stairs, and stood right beside me. <laughs> you were here? It, I'm like, okay. <laughs> we're going to roll with it. I'm kind of looking around for the ushers. They go, okay, we're good. We're good. And as, as people were praying and as we had led them in the sinner's prayer, this little girl who could not have been more than three or four years old, she comes up and she tugs on my pants. And she says, will you pray for my daddy to come home? Now, I'm not sure if her dad was in jail or, or whatever, but I, I looked over her shoulder to make sure there was an adult with her and there, were, there seemed to be somebody that was very much fixed on her. So I'm like, okay, so we prayed. You know, the reality is, church, that there are people in our lives all around us who are beating that pan. We just need somebody to pray with him, somebody to encourage them, somebody to bless them. So can I challenge you in 2014, look for people who are beating the pan and encourage them and bless them. You'll be happy, they'll be happy, right? In order for you to be happy, all you need is a need. That's a deep thought right there. All you need is a need. So when you see those Facebook statuses, you're like, why in the world are you that transparent? Just bless them, encourage them, like the snot out of everything. You know, we, 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 Facebook has recreated junior high in cyberspace. You know, we, it's all about how many friends we have, you know, and how many people like me and how many people like my post and like my picture. Well, guess what? Go ahead and like everything then. Make everybody feel good. Come on, somebody. Now, that doesn't devalue my like when I like your stuff. I'm just saying, but that's how I roll Number two, look for people to love. If you're going to leave well, live well in 2014. Number three, make it right with everybody in the world. Make it right with everybody in the world. Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? If my brother keeps on sinning against me, if my sister keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive them? And Peter thought, probably thought he was being pretty, pretty gracious when he said, seven times? Do you remember Jesus' answer to Peter? He says, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. 
One doctor that I read said that the majority of diseases are caused by unforgiveness and bitterness. Forgiveness is the key to freedom. Let me know you are tied to whatever you hate. You are tied to whatever you hate. Now, here's the deal. I can't control the way people talk. I can't control the way people think and how they think about me. But I can control my thoughts. I can control my attitude. I can control my heart. Are you with me today? That's why Jesus said, do good to those who hate you. He said, pray for your enemies. Love them. Why was he saying that? He says, because it's going to work out well for you. You're going to live well from 2014 when you make it right with everybody in the world. Corey Ten Boom shares this true story in her book, The Hiding Place. It was a church service in Munich that I saw him. The former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück, which was a concentration camp. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing to me. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that as you say, he washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had preached so often to the people in Bloomingdale the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I couldn't do it. I felt nothing not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathe the silent prayer, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened from my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it's not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but it's on his. And when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself to do it. Life is too short to carry grudges. So let it go. Don't let 2013, what happened in 2013, already determined what's going to happen in 2014. Don't let your past determine your future. You're never going to have an abundant life in 2014 if you're hanging on to everything that happened in 2013. So let it go. Lay it down. Bring it to the cross and let God change your heart. Give you the love that you need to forgive and start the new year fresh and new. Somebody say amen. amen. If you're going to live well in 2014, number four, live one day at a time. Remember that old song we used to sing at church? I'm not going to sing it for you today. I'm just not feeling it. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. How many remember that old song? All right. Well, I guess we all could have sang it together. One day at a time. You guys are a great Gaither church. That's all I got to say. All right. Matthew 6, says, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you. And he will provide you with all these other things. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles that each day brings. Jesus said, listen, here's how you're supposed to live. Don't worry about tomorrow. Live each day like it's your last. How many know when a baby is born, we start the can't wait game? Can't wait till the baby's born. Then we can't wait till the baby's out of diapers. Then we can't wait till he's in school. Then we can't wait till he's a teenager and can take care of himself. And he can't wait till the, then we can't wait till they get married. And then we can't wait till they have a grandchild. And then all of a sudden, 
You're wishing you had back all those yesterdays that you couldn't wait to get over. We spend our life thinking about tomorrow, worrying about tomorrow. And when, when tomorrow comes, we're wishful for all of our yesterdays. Jesus said, watch this. Jesus said, I didn't say, Jesus said, focus on today. If you want to live the abundant life, one day at a time. Live one day at a time. Focus on today and be blessed. Here's a story that I love to tell. I turned the volume up on my radio in order to listen to, by the way, the answer is yes. Uh, our guest speaker will be here at the second service. So you can come twice. I'm just saying. All right. Back to me. Back to me. This is called A Thousand Marvels. I turned the volume up on my radio in order to listen to a Saturday morning talk show. I heard an older sounding chap with a golden voice. You know the kind. He sounded like he should be in the broadcasting business himself. He was talking about a thousand marbles to someone named Tom. I was intrigued and sat down to listen to what he had to say. Well, Tom, it sure sounds like you're busy with your job. I'm sure they pay you well, but it's a shame you have to be away from your home and your family so much. Hard to believe a young fellow should have to work 60 or 70 hours a week to make ends meet. Too bad you missed your daughter's dance recital. He continued, let me tell you something, Tom, something that has helped me keep a good perspective on my own priorities. And that's when he began to explain his theory of a thousand marbles. You see, I sat down one day and I did a little arithmetic. The average person lives about 75 years. I know some live more and some live less, but on average, folks live about 75 years. Now then I multiplied 75 times 52 and I came up with 3,900, which is the number of Saturdays that the average person has in their entire lifetime. Now stick with me, Tom. I'm getting to the important part. It took me until I was 55 years old to think about all this in any detail. He went on, and by that time, I had lived through over 2,800 Saturdays. I got to thinking that if I lived to be 75, I only had about 1,000 of them left to enjoy. So I went to a toy store and bought every single marble they had. I ended up having to visit three toy stores, toy stores to round up 1,000 marbles. I took them home and put them inside of a large clear plastic container right here in my workshop next to the radio. Every Saturday since then, I've taken one marble out and thrown it away. I found that by watching the marbles diminish, I focused more on the really important things in life. There's nothing like watching your time here on this earth run out to help you get your priorities straight. Now, let me tell you one last thing before I sign off with you and take my lovely wife out for breakfast. This morning, I took the very last marble out of the container. I figure if I make it until next Saturday, then God has blessed me with a little extra time to be with loved ones. It was nice to talk to you, Tom. I hope you spend more time with your loved ones and I hope to meet you again someday. Have a good morning. You could have heard a pin drop when he finished. Even the show's moderator didn't have anything to say for a few moments. I guess he gave us a lot to think about. I had planned to do some work that morning and then go to the gym. Instead, I went upstairs and woke up my wife with a kiss. Come on, honey, I'm taking you and the kids to breakfast. What brought this on, she asked with a smile. Nothing special, I said. It's been a long time since we spent a Saturday together with the kids. And hey, can we stop at a toy store while we're out? I need to buy some marbles. <laughs> if you're going to live the abundant life in 2014, you live one day at a time. Ask God to help you to focus on today. God, what are you saying today? God, what can I do today? What should I remember today? And God will bless as a result. Somebody say amen. Number five, I'm almost done. If you're gonna live the abundant life in 2014, do everything you can do for the glory of God. Do whatever you do for the glory of God. Every action, every act of service, Everything that you do, the Bible says, do it all for the glory of God. Well, pastor, I did something in the church and nobody recognized me for it. Nobody patted me on the back. Nobody said anything on the platform. My name's not in the bulletin. Nobody sent me a thank you note. What's up with that? Well, you did it for the wrong reason then. 
Because the Bible says, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Can I tell you the Bible, if you're gonna be happy for the rest of your life, remember that old song, never make a pretty woman or wife, that's not what I'm saying here today. If you're gonna be happy, the scripture says, do everything you do for the glory of God. Don't do it for recognition. Don't do it for rewards. Don't do it because somebody's gonna pat you on the back. Do it for the glory of God. Why am I doing what I'm doing? I'm doing it for the audience of one person because on that day, I'm gonna stand before him and I wanna hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that way when people fail to recognize me and when people fail to pat me on the back, when people fail to sing you the thank you note and they will fail, You understand that you serve a God who will never forget, who will never let anything go. He will reward you. He will bless you because of his glory, his power, and his strength. So don't live for yourself, the scripture says. Do everything for the glory of God. Do every attitude, every action, everything that you do. Why do we do it? We do it for the glory of God. He always notices, and he'll never forget. Number six, if you're gonna live the abundant life in 2014, Whatever you want in life, that's what you give away. You decide what you want in life and then give that away. You guys know that if you want to grow corn, you put corn in the ground, right? If you want to grow potatoes, you put potatoes in the ground. If you want peas, you put peas in the ground. If you want whatever it is, you have to sow it. You have to give it away. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We talk about that in the context of money and resources all the time, and it certainly applies to that, but it applies to everything else as well. If you want to be criticized by others, go ahead and criticize. If you want, if you want, if you want people to be negative around you, be a negative person, right? Whatever you want, give that away. But if you want to be blessed, be a blessing. If you want friends, be a friend. If you want compassion, show compassion. Come on, somebody, right? That's the scripture. So the bottom line is the quality of our lives today is because of what we have sown yesterday. The quality of your life today is a result of what you, sh- what you sowed yesterday, So whatever you want in life, give that away. The secret of living is truly giving yourself, your time, your resources, giving of yourself. If you want to be loved, be the most loving person you can be. If you want to have peace, be a peacemaker. If you want friends in your life, be a friend. Lastly, number seven, and we're going to pray. Living well in 2014 means living the crucified life. Living the crucified life. Matthew 16, Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Now listen, that one scripture in the Bible is repeated almost six times. When Jesus says, if you want to have a blessed life, give it away. If you want to have an abundant life, embrace the cross. If you want to live, you've got to die. I've been doing some academic work the last few days. I've got to finish up some work for a master's class I took some years ago uh, about cross-cultural communications. And I was rereading the notes from the professor in this class. And he was talking about how this new generation of churches, the new generation of American Christianity, he goes, the reason that it's not transforming people's lives, get this, is because there's no death in it. Now hang with me. He goes, there's no death in it. And he he goes back to this particular verse and he says, listen, in order for you to live, you have to die. In order for you to live the abundant life in Jesus Christ, you got to come to a cross and give your life away. And somehow, some way in our culture, we've tried to negotiate with God where I want to have a blessed life. I want to have a great life, but I want my own stuff. I want it on my terms. I want it on my schedule. I want it. I want it the way I want it. That's not how it works. 
There are plenty of churches these days that will tell you, you don't have to die. Just add Jesus to your life and everything will be okay. Listen, this is not about adding Jesus to your life. This is about you dying and embracing the cross. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. And you know what he said? You'll live. The best life you'll ever live is the crucified life. Paul said, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. That's the hope of God. Romans 6, 13 says, give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life and use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 says, this is what the Lord your God wants you to do. Respect the Lord and do what he's told you to do. Love him, serve the Lord your God with all of your being. If you're straddling the fence in your walk with God these days and you got one foot in the world and, but you go to church, okay? But, but you've got this set of friends that are very worldly and you kind of enjoy that and, or, you, or the, what, it, what you watch and where you go and what you listen to. You just you got one foot planted firmly in the world and you got you know, one foot in the church. I like church. I like Pastor Wayne. I'm prophesying, all right? I like grace. I like coming, you know, once in a while and but can I tell you that it'll never work. As much as somebody wants to come alongside you and pat you on the back, it'll be okay. It will never be okay. The only way you live is if you die. There's got to be some death in it. And can I tell you, I can testify and all kinds of people can testify in this room today. The day you started to live is the day you chose to die. The day I chose to die to me, to myself, to my life. Young person, if you're here today, young adult, if you're here today, say, what's the key to an abundant life? Give it to the Lord. Come to an altar and say, God, it's yours. I surrender all the old song says. You know what's going to happen to you? God's not going to punish you. God's not going to give you this miserable life in return. He will give you everything your heart's desires. Am I preaching the truth here today? The Bible says, this is the way life works. If you follow it, your life will go well. Jesus said, if you want to live, come and die. Don't go halfway. Give God everything. Would you stand with me in this place? Phil, could you come and play this morning? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes here in this room today? I'm crazy enough to believe that all of the details of today actually worked out for a divine appointment for some of us here in this place. I'll be honest with you when I, just a few days ago, a thought occurred to me, what would you preach, Wayne, if your speaker doesn't show up? Now, I, you can, matter of fact, go ahead and look at me. Don't bow your head because you'll go to sleep, all right? Look at me. I, I had this thought. No, pastors always have this thought because days like today happen. But this is what God spoke to me about a few days ago. Like, and, for, and, and I don't know why. I'm just saying that when it became clear we're going to have to call an audible this morning, I knew exactly where I was going. I don't know why. Except... You probably know why. Because God brought you here for a reason so that you could hear what he wants you to say, what he wants to say into your life. Now, next week, we're going to ask the question, what is God saying? But today we can begin by saying, what has God said to me today about forgiveness? About living one day at a time? About slowing down? about giving what I want away, about embracing the cross. Because if you will do those things, I can confidently tell you today that 2014 will be the best year of your life. And that's what we want. I said, that's what we want. But we have to obey God. We have to listen to him. And if we will, his word will take effect in our lives. And we'll have an abundant life. The one that he promised. The one that he said that we should be living. 
no matter where we go and no matter what happens to us, we'll be living an abundant life. Is that what we want? Now you can bow your head if you don't mind and listen closely to me. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, you know, God's speaking to me today about slowing down. My life is out of control. My schedule is too, too much. It's here, it's gone. And God is speaking to me today that I need to do with God's help. I need to slow down my life. Raise your hand, that's you. God's speaking to me. I need to slow down. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. We talked about looking for people to love, showing compassion. If there's a need in your life, God brings somebody in in your path that needs something. We're supposed to be the ones to reach out to them. You see, Pastor, when you were sharing that, God spoke to me that there are some people in my life that I need to show compassion to. And with God's help, I'm going to do that in the new year. Raise your hand if that's you here today. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. We talked about forgiveness, making it right with everybody in the world. This is between you and God. This is not about me or you or anybody else. You say, you know what, Pastor, there's some people I need to make it right with today. It's too long. It's been far too long. Life's too short to live with grudges and unforgiveness and bitterness. And with God's help, I'm going to show forgiveness in the new year. Raise your hand real high. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Living one day at a time slowing down, focusing on the moments that God has given to us. Is anybody here today say, Pastor, that's me, one day at a time. Instead of always looking to the future, God bless you for raising your hand. We talked about everything you do, you're doing it for the glory of God. The Bible says we don't do it for others, we do it for God. That's our motives. When we spoke that, the Holy Spirit was speaking to some of you today saying, I need to do things for the right reasons instead of being concerned about others' reactions and others and rewards. I want my heart to be right toward the Lord and everything I do, I do for Him. If that's you today, would you raise your hand real high? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The scripture says that whatever we one in our lives, we need to give that away. Give and it will be given to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. God spoke to you as we were speaking about giving, time, energy, resources, friendship, love, compassion. If that's you today, would you just respond by saying, yeah, that's me. God was speaking to me about those things. Amen. And then last thing. Live the crucified life. If you're going to, in order for you to live, You've got to die. If you're here today and you see, Pastor, I've, I've never given my life to Christ. I've never fully surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And today I recognize and understand that I need Jesus. I'm not here to negotiate my salvation. I'm here to surrender. I'm here to give my life to Jesus. If you've never done that today and you say, Pastor, I'd like to give my life to Christ today. I would like to fully surrender my life to the Lord today. Would you raise your hand real high today so that we can pray for you and ask God to change your life? Just one more moment. One more moment. God, we pray today for what we've heard. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak sovereignly to us. And God, as you have spoken to us. Give us the courage to obey it, to do it. Lord, we pray today that you would come alongside us the way you came alongside Corey Ten Boom to show forgiveness and mercy, to show love and compassion, to be generous, to give, to make it right with everybody in the world, to live a life of crucified, embracing the cross, living one day at a time and doing everything that we do for the glory of God. Lord, it's our prayer today that as we bring 2013 to a close and as we enter into this new year, God, that you would do wonderful things among us. Speak to us, God, about the new year. Speak to us about our schedule. Speak to us about our priorities. Speak to us about our relationships. Speak to us, God, about our future. Speak to us about our ministry. Speak to us about the church. 
And God, we pray that your will be done through us. May this new year be the year when everything changes for the better as we follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. I love you, church. It is such a tremendous privilege to be the leader of this great church, to bless and encourage you. You are a wonderful congregation. And today in all of our uh, last minute changes just proves that, that when we pray and when we love each other and we follow Jesus, everything's going to work out okay.